so this presentation, it's uh, 45 minutes. I usually like to keep the presentations open for questions. So uh, if you feel in the middle of the presentation that there is a pressing question, uh, I think we could manage it and uh, dive deeper a little bit. Otherwise, I leave 10 minutes at the end to uh, open open questions. I'm going to present uh, current, uh, I would say, I would call it a snapshot of what is happening in artificial intelligence, how I see it, what is the state of the field from uh, my, mm, what I can see from my uh, surrounding uh, technological network. And uh, one of the topics that uh, at this moment seems to be the hottest is uh, called composite AI, which I will be talking about mainly today with some applications. And uh, I first uh, give a little bit of background what I went through. Uh, then I will uh, define how we treat AI these days and uh, use some industrial analysis to show how the hype splines are working in 2022. I have, uh, with that regard, uh, pretty fresh reports from Gartner and McKinsey. Uh, they are about 10 days old. So we will look at some graphs. And then I will uh, look into the application when we have all that cool AI, uh, who is going to pay for it and how we are going to apply it and look at some case studies, how it has been done before. Let's do it. So my background uh, has started uh, in Prague at Charles University. Started, uh, I was uh, studying at Faculty of Mathematics and Physics. Uh, it was, it's, it, it was a really good experience uh, for geeky people. And uh, there I have uh, got my uh, diploma, master's diploma, then I started PhD. And uh, I have done the PhD bouncing around uh, many different institutions around the world. Because uh, in academic world, PhD students are the food soldiers. They are just uh, pretty cheap. You can hire them uh, to extend your team to do some fringe research areas that uh, may be worthwhile, maybe not. But uh, generally, PhD students have good mobility. So any one of you that is thinking about starting a PhD program, uh, that's one of big perks that uh, you can get everywhere in the world. And it's very easy. The system is generally, the legislations are very open to uh, PhD students' mobility. In my case, um, I have spent a significant amount of time uh, in La Cienares in France, where I worked with uh, the creators of planning systems uh, for uh, exploration, deep space exploration, Mars exploration uh, in Europe under European Space Agency. And uh, after that, I bounced to Google in California for some time, and I finished my doctorate in Microsoft in Denmark. And uh, after that, I moved to a short postdoc at the University of Toronto. I have uh, moved to Stanford at 2016 got some funding from uh, RPI Park. Um, with regard to my focus, I have uh, always uh, tried to connect the continuous artificial intelligence with the symbolic artificial intelligence. And uh, that seemed to get lots of traction. So for example, optimizing Los Angeles, we have focused on how to kind of build better Google Maps, but uh, build them starting from the ground and focusing on a personal experience. So we have been modeling with machine learning how people behave and what they like and what are their personal preferences on top of operations research and symbolic reasoners that were trying to optimize the traffic. So everyone is happy in the traffic and they are more inclined to take the recommendations while minimizing the total energy consumption of the city. This has been a two years project that we got funding from RPI. And uh, it was pretty successful uh, with regard to organizations that I have been at. But uh, in uh, some of the research laboratories, they do not really know how to productize. And uh, I'm not sure if it happened to some of you before, but uh, when you successfully exit, you sell all the trade secrets. You sell everything that you have worked on and you cannot uh, work on it anymore because it's not your intellectual property anymore. So uh, that feels like uh, if you lose your uh, favorite puppet or something that you have worked on for some time and it's not yours anymore. So uh, that has uh, pushed me and motivated me to transition into uh, more industrial applications where you can see your research work in a product as well. 
and I have hopped into a startup called Octon, and uh, that's one of the successful exits that we had recently last year. After that, I moved to Schlumberger, which has been oil and gas applications. In both companies, I have uh, been uh, driving and architecting AI architectures uh, that are mixing together symbolic reasoning and machine learning. And uh, this is, as I mentioned, uh, going to be the topic of this talk. But first, let's define artificial intelligence. What is it? Um, there have been historically several definitions. Uh, I have pinpointed uh, three that I like personally, and uh, that is the behavior that is commonly taught as a requiring intelligence. This is definition by uh, US, uh, formal definition by US government. Uh, Mervyn Minsky, a personality in AI, said that uh, it's uh, anything that uh, would require intelligence if done by man. So that means uh, just uh, anything that you yourself consider complicated enough can be considered artificial intelligence if it is not done by people. That's a very, very broad definition. It can capture everything. Uh, the last one is, I think, uh, probably one of the better fits. Uh, having AI to be a study of uh, how computers can do things better than people. And uh, that's a uh, I think uh, more closer to the current perception of AI and how it is used as an umbrella term for some uh, technological horizon. When you are moving forward with uh, development, with uh, looking at new domains of uh, human interest, you always come to new topic and you see some topic. Let's find out how to build this table in optimal way. Let's use AI. How to do it? Uh, it uh, becomes exploration of concepts, how things can be done. And when you do not know how to do it yet, you use uh, mathematical brute force techniques uh, like genetic algorithms, neural networks, uh, to try to find some first solution. And at that moment, you start calling it AI. Once you find the solution that works the best, you can then build algorithms that are really good at uh, this particular approach that is solving the problem that you have found out. And then uh, it stops being AI. It just jumps out of the frontier of that moving horizon. Uh, by example, at the beginning of uh, what we call modern AI, uh, Jan Lacun has been doing lots of uh, OCR, I think in New York, uh, and uh, he was calling it AI. That was the manifestation of AI. He was just recognizing characters on US forums, and uh, that has been the state of the art of AI that he was able to do it really well. After uh, several decades, we just call it OC OCR. It's not AI anymore. It's just optical character recognition. There is a state of the there is a set of state of the art tools to do it really well, and when we need to do it, we just apply it. Not considered AI anymore. So, uh, I think that uh, looking at AI as the d moving horizon of technology might be the most most useful um, most useful uh, definition of AI today. It's a buzzword. It can be seen as a buzzword, uh, but uh, how it is used, uh, this horizon is probably the most fitting from my point of view. Uh, what motivates uh, when we start using this buzzword as a, let's say, modern technology, uh, what motivates us to use AI in the first place? Uh, I like to use this uh, comparison when we look at uh, capability to decision making that humans can manifest and what machine can manifest. Uh, on this graph, I'm showing, uh, I hope it's not too small, I'm showing uh, on the y-axis, uh, or on the x-axis, the number of parts that we need to think about. And uh, then on the y-axis, the quality of the solution that we can achieve. So we can imagine that uh, if we have small system, there are several processes that we need to organize. Uh, then uh, we need to do just a few decisions as a human, comparing two things, which one should come first, or which option is better to achieve a pretty good solution. So that's when we are on the left, top left portion of this graph, or top, top down, actually. When we just do small amounts of decisions to achieve optimal solution. As the number of parts grow, and uh, we, uh, as we would like to maintain the closeness to the optimal solution, it becomes more and more difficult. And uh, this green area, this green kind of a tri triangle is showing uh, approximation of what human capabilities are. 
the yellow area is what are the capabilities of the modern AI, or let's say uh, technology in general, computer technology in general these days. And the red part is what we can do at this moment. Red part is kind of like uh, the area of breaking uh, your private Bitcoin wallets. That's something that uh, shouldn't be possible at this moment. And uh, when I uh, played around with DALI, and I uh, told uh, DALI to illustrate this graph, uh, I came, with, came up with some nice images, uh, probably the bottom, uh, bottom right uh, looks the best, as we can see the yellow AI uh, being out of reach of what the human can do, and uh, the red UFO is uh, something that is not achievable these days. And DALI has generated it pretty well. This one was the best. So that's part of AI that I'm not going to, going to talk about today, but it's definitely one of the interesting manifestations of what uh, modern deep learning can do. So uh, we can summarize this slide. Uh, machines can bring value because they can achieve solutions that are closer to optimality than people can. And there is still some space that uh, is not achievable even by machines. What is happening in AI? Gartner has just uh, released uh, some uh, breakdown of AI technologies, how they are moving forward and uh, what, we what we can expect from them. Uh, the hype, hype scale is a very uh, traditional scale for not only technologies, but for ideas, for concepts that come to society. At the beginning, we get triggered, we become excited, we think it's a holy grail. Uh, then it reaches some peak, and then uh, it reaches the situation when we overpromise and underdeliver. And uh, at that moment, it starts sliding down into the body of uh, disillusion. This is uh, the current situation of deep learning to large merit because, and machine learning because it has overpromised uh, what it can deliver and it has been used in many different applications where it wasn't the best fit. And that has led to, if you look at studies by McKenzie and Gartner, to failure of machine learning projects uh, in majority of cases which uh, opens uh, new ideas, opens new space for different approaches to AI. And uh, in this case, uh, we can categorize the main drives of AI into four, four groups, four classes. We can look at uh, AI that is focused on data. This is the data-centric direction. And then there are model-centric, application-centric, human-centric, what we can see that is popping up. And the data-centric is probably the most, uh, well, it's very valuable, but not uh, as innovative as the other AI's, AI directions. Uh, in data centric, we consider data to be our uh, main source of value, and we try to enrich the data, we try to improve the data, we try to transform the data in different ways, and we build up a form of frameworks how to do it. Uh, in the model centric, we are thinking about uh, how we can break down uh, AI problems, or generally any type of uh, data-supported problems, any type of real-world problems, into parts that are continuous and that are discrete, and find causality within those models. Uh, that's a different approach than uh, trying to look at everything as, uh, let's say, some, um, uh, some uh, mm, gradient-based method learnable system. Uh, like uh, reinforcement learning is trying to do, where you just build single policy that is supposed to learn absolutely everything end to end. Uh, in the model-centric uh, approach class these days, we uh, understand that there are some problems that uh, with very small perturbance uh, at the input can have very different results on the output, which contradicts the paradigm of modern machine learning, where you are trying to fit some curve through some data points in space, in some very large vector space, and you are trying to have that curve approximate the whole space, generalize over the whole space. But if very small perturbances at your input, for example, if you take some uh, graph of uh, flights around the world, you have these days 20,000 airports, you have lots of flights in between them at different times. You try to optimize over them uh, how people should move around, how packages should move around. Then if you uh, just kick off, you change one bit at the input and you kick 
uh, flight from New York to London out of the question, then uh, it's going to completely change the result that you get. And uh, this is not happening in continuous problems. When you are trying to distinguish, when you are trying to find out if it's a cat or dog on the picture, it's not very likely that if you change a single pixel, you do s uh, the same minimal perturbance, that it, the result is going to be different. And uh, many of the real-world problems have that quality that uh, with very small perturbance of the input, the result will change dramatically. And uh, symbolic AI, causal AI, is focusing on being able to handle and model those problems. Uh, then, together with uh, modeling continuous problems, we can speak about composite AI, which I will get to in a bit. Uh, Application-centric AI directions uh, are also on the race. They are focusing on AI from the perspective of uh, the actual use case and how to uh, maintain the AI uh, as a tool in the best possible quality for that use case, which usually means that you are trying to capture the whole AI development cycle. You want to have uh, some uh, machine learning operations, for example, where the models get versioned, you can blame people for doing wrong, uh, wrongly some part of the model, you are uh, constantly monitoring them, you are continually uh, incrementally building them, and you are continually testing them if uh, you have observed some data skew or if uh, in some way the model is not representative of what you want to achieve anymore. Uh, this is a very busy area where we have moved from experimentation with models uh, where the goal has been to write a paper to a journal and say that we were able to, in some very tiny, tiny case, uh, learn something that has been before very difficult. Uh, so we have these days moved into real operations, which is the application-centric view of using artificial intelligence, where we want to capture AI at the same level as uh, we are using software these days. And uh, this level is, has not yet been achieved, and this field is on the growth. We can see it uh, at several, several points uh, in the two to five years range. Uh, finally, there is a direction of AI focused on people, and uh, that's uh, very popular because it's nice to talk about it. It's nice to talk about the danger of AI taking over and thinking about Terminators, Skynet, and so on. So we have had uh, several directions like ethical AI, responsible AI, popping up, and uh, they are really nice to write stories about, and they make good headlines, and uh, they also attract lots of attention, uh, not necessarily from people with mathematical background but uh, or technical data, scienti data scientist type of background. Uh, they may attract lawyers. They uh, are kind of widening the range of understanding how we use AI. What is, what is the impact of using AI in autonomous systems? Who is responsible? Who is going to pay for the damage? Uh, is it the software engineer that built it? Is it the author of the framework? Those questions uh, come up and they need to be solved. So at the current state of the industrial adoption of AI technologies, we have those uh, four categories that are covering uh, what, what is going to be the next flow in next two, two to ten years probably. Um, some of them, artificial general intelligence, unfortunately, is still a little bit behind. Uh, we may not expect anything new there. And autonomous vehicles are uh, at level five, which means complete autonomy are not moving forward very quickly either. Uh, we can see uh, for autonomous uh, driving, we can see some, or autonomous vehicle operations, we can see some improvements for level four when uh, we are within a closed domain. A closed domain uh, in this case means uh, known environment that you can either tag or you can prevent unexpected events. So, uh, for example, crates uh, at building sites or any type of uh, closed logistic system where we are moving around uh, different boxes and you have lots of trucks that are bringing things in. And they can operate almost autonomously. In a Czech hospital that uh, I was looking into some time ago, they have uh, the hospital called Moto. They have uh, a large portion of food delivery, fully autonomous. It was uh, amazing that they already had it 10, 10 years ago. Uh, that's level, level four autonomy for a very small case that is very helpful. So let's say that we go in the composite AI direction. Um, who is going to pay for it? 
we need uh, uh, for the hype of machine learning from large uh, to large merit came from applications in marketing because uh, we became able to very precisely predict the define the probability that uh, who, who to show um, let's say advertisement for Harley Davidson uh, when they just recently looked at Google search and uh, they were they have had their particular history of searches or uh, what is the probability that you are going to buy certain product when you on a Foursquare go close to certain shop and uh, this is a machine learning application that uh, is in continuous space and uh, having the capability to feed as many uh, resources as you can uh, computationally, uh, we, were, we became really good at predicting it. Uh, we might have noticed it in the last 20 years that the search engines just became really good at serving queue ads and uh, many, many other at uh, serving frameworks became much better on Facebook and other technologies. Uh, intelligent automation uh, is a field that is growing into $600 billion a year uh, for 2022 only. And uh, we can see that uh, there is a space, th those money are spent on software that uh, executes intelligent automation. And uh, we can see that uh, being able to deliver to that market uh, through uh, artificial intelligence is going to be significant am amount of funding that would uh, allow us to develop uh, certain artificial intelligence. Uh, the question is which one? In this case, uh, my, my hypothesis is it's going to be composite AI because composite AI uh, solves this problem. What is the problem? When we start aggregating automation systems together, uh, their state spaces are growing exponentially they multiply. When you take uh, one system that, uh, let's say, in a factory controls, uh, it's a planning system that tells you how to build a bike, how you have to cut the tubes, how to plug them together, and so on. And then you have a factory where you optimize uh, how the machines should be close to each other, what should be the paths uh, within the factory, and uh, which machine should be doing which part at what time, and who should be next to the machine, and so on. Those problems, when they are separate, they are well solved in the field of operations research. But when you merge them, the, spa the state space becomes uh, exponentially larger than those individual problems before. This is uh, because uh, all the decisions, all the atomic decisions that I do in the first part of the problem is going to have some impact in the second part of the problem. Uh, this has been historically addressed by siloing, uh, just separating into uh, the optimization into a waterfall that we go step by step. This is not efficient. We are missing lots of opportunity for optimization. And uh, we also cannot do it really with engineering only because when we just uh, try to build uh, more pipelines around it, when we try to hard code how uh, those decisions from one system should be impacting the other system, uh, it will grow into, with the exponential growth of the state space, it will grow, in, grow into unmaintainable spaghetti code. We need some conceptual approach, how to handle the complexity that is arising from merging large automation systems. Uh, there have been, in the history, different ways how to try to solve real-world problems end-to-end. -end. In Strips era, which is like 60s, 70s uh, of previous century, people thought we can model everything as uh, logical systems. We just describe the world in terms of first order predicate logic and it's done. Then we just solve it, we find the fastest plan and it's done. Uh, unfortunately, this is computationally unfeasible, unfeasible and uh, it cannot handle continuous variables real well. Uh, then the opposite line of thought uh, that uh, Jan Lakun, uh, he's a chief scientist of uh, scientist of Meta, and he has been propagating. I think he released it at the end of uh, June that uh, we can build end-to-end -end automation systems using only machine learning, as long as it is differentiable. We can just learn it with gradient-based methods. It's uh, a thesis, and uh, it has. Uh, lots of shortcuts and expectations. And it has this one, a magic component you can find in the model on the top. It's called configurator. And it tells all the other learning components how they should behave. 
magically. It knows the right parameterization. Um, I think that it's an interesting concept, and there is a lot of development needed to uh, have some results uh, to uh, what merit it can be done, but computationally, it's not feasible at this moment. Uh, composite AI says that it uh, postulates that we can solve any real-world problem by combining different parts of artificial intelligence and using the right models for the right sub-problems. And then uh, the only question is how to combine them, how to compose, compose them together. And uh, in my opinion, composite AI is uh, something we can already apply. We can apply it to large merit. We do not know how to make the compositions uh, automatically yet, completely automatically, but uh, we are on the way there. And uh, one approach how to do it is uh, just conceptually on a high level, start breaking everything into sub-problems. We take high-level problem, we find uh, the main, difficult, uh, the main uh, dimensions of difficulty, we start from the most difficult part that is most impactful, and then we start breaking down the top-level problem into sub-problems until we reach a level at which we can transform those problems into solvers from that particular set of AI, from that particular field of AI, and solve it. Once we have solved the atomic problems at the leaves, we can bubble it, propagate it up, and uh, get a solution of the original top-level problem. Uh, conceptually, this is very straightforward. It has been done before. There are hard parts in, the, in finding the right decomposition, because it may not be always possible. It may not be possible without sacrificing some solution space. But uh, as I said, the combination of uh, multiple systems together is really large. It's exponentially larger than uh, all of them individually. Uh, what solvers can we use? There is an mm, enormous amount of research that has been done on how to model different parts of real-world problems, and we can look at them from a probabilistic point of view. We can look at them from uh, perspectives of graph theory, pattern formation, system theory, evolution, adaptation. Uh, there are subfields that are focused on uh, individual problems that were used in practice from uh, internet traffic using uh, swarm intelligence for uh, routing the packets optimally or semi-optimally. Uh, there are graph theory concepts that are controlling the largest logistic systems in the world like FedEx, DHL, and so on. Uh, so uh, all that research, most of that research, 95% is available. You can just uh, find the right study that is going to help you to solve that subproblem and uh, then compose it. Then once you have found the paper, you have found the solver, the challenge that remains is uh, how to do the decomposition and composition. So I hope it's readable. This is an example how a composition, composite uh, AI blueprint can look like. We take some real-time operation control. Let's say we are building autonomous system. So this is autonomous system blueprint that can control autonomous vehicle in space. This can control a factory. And this has been used before. This has been applied before. It can control drilling operations in Qatar. And uh, the system just breaks down the real-time operation control into observation, where we have a cascade of subdomains that use uh, other different uh, leaf uh, solvers. It can be a convolution neural network that is uh, watching your engine and telling you if it is malfunctioning or if it is performing as expected. It can be a vibration monitoring system that is uh, telling you if uh, you have, that it classifies uh, at what state you are. Uh, once the observation is done, which usually means that you try to discretize all the continuous information into, into labels, into some classes that you can work with, that are on logical level, that have some semantics that you can work with, uh, then you can start diagnosing the system. Once you diagnose it, uh, well, diagnostic itself, it's a combination of uh, rule engines that is telling you what are the consistent states of the world. So uh, you essentially either say the world is consistent or it's not consistent. If it is not consistent, how do you say what is wrong with the world? Uh, then you 
apply another set of tools uh, known from uh, constraint programming. And you can uh, find explanations. You can find minimal critical sets, uh, minimal diagnoses. Those are uh, subsets of the rules that are pinpointing uh, either the component that is uh, doing something wrong, or they generally tell you uh, what is the minimal set of rules that if you take them out, uh, are going to make the system consistent, or what is the minimal set of rules that if you put them into empty system is going to make the system go wrong, be inconsistent. And this is valuable information that you can build the next component on, which is the recovery. And for recovery, for example, a very straightforward way how to do recovery is to use behavior trees. They have been used uh, across many robotic applications. They can uh, collect the fast behavior that is uh, easy to implement because it's independent. It's, uh, let's say, collision avoidance. You have autonomous car and you are using this blueprint to control autonomous car, then you would like uh, the, uh, the recovery to prevent any collision that the car can get into. And this is behavior that is going to overrule any long-term planning. Uh, when we speak about planning, you need some long-term planning to achieve your goals, which is the next component, that's the plan component. You would like to break down the planning, uh, long-term planning into sub-components where you are able to efficiently, optimally find out all the actions that you need to do to execute the plan. So again, drilling, drilling in Qatar takes seven weeks. You need uh, 5,000 actions to execute it step by step. And uh, this is what you get. This is what the plan, the planning part is going to produce. Once you have this set, then you would like to execute it. And that's the last component. You execute it step by step. You monitor that all of the execution is uh, going forward properly, that all the actions are succeeding. And if something fails, you just run in this loop again. You are continually observing, diagnosing, recovering if something fails, replanning, and going on. So this is an example of composite AI blueprint used uh, in intelligent automation context. And this one is uh, pretty, pretty useful. Let's look at some use cases. So this has been my uh, second Silicon Valley type of company. We have uh, been building up uh, software operational system for uh, factories that are composed from 3D printing machines. And that brings some interesting space for optimization. Uh, first, uh, you would like to pack as many different objects into the single printing bed as you can, because they are generally expensive, it's titanium, it takes a long time, and so on. At the same time, you have some limited amount of machines, and those machines can be distributed around different factories, around a certain country, or around the world. Uh, you would like to take into context the logistics when you build a part, how long is it going to take to reach the customer, and uh, you would like to prepare or have certain uh, capability to predict the success of uh, each operation. And uh, then from the customer, you generally receive a quote. They ask you, can you build two millions of uh, some hearing aids, which need to be custom built, each of them is absolutely unique. Uh, can you tell us how much is it going to be? So in our case, we were able to do it under two minutes, compute uh, any, any size of quotation and uh, then the second part has been how to execute it. Uh, once the customer says, I like this price, I'm buying, uh, then the distribution to the machines and execution of the jobs has been also part of the operation system. Uh, nice application of uh, composite AI for intelligent automation running on this pattern, exactly this pattern. And uh, when we look at the impact, to make use of the graph that I have shown before. Uh, when we look at the difference of uh, how better the intelligent automation is using, using the actual AI optimization, we can just uh, look at the difference between what would a human choose as a solution given, their, given, our, <laughs> given our limited mental capabilities. <laughs> Uh, and what the machine could do. So basically, uh, when you look at the yellow column, uh, you just look at the difference between the costs of the top, uh, top row and the bottom row, and that gives you what uh, probably cannot, you cannot treat at the bottom. 
but uh, this is this is the actual savings uh, that you get from the optimization and uh, this projection that we were using as a marketing sales sale in the marketing sales pitch on five machines uh, just uh, three percent distance from optimality which is uh, somewhere closer to the end on the right uh, gives you uh, savings thirty thousand dollars per machine per year and uh, this has been large selling point why to use why to uh, replace human decision making with AI decision making in oil and gas uh, the challenge has been a little bit different I work I work in Schlumberger and uh, that has been to achieve a certain level of autonomy we have reached 85 percent level of autonomous control of operations uh, things that have been done previously by field engineers moving joysticks around monitoring waveforms uh, we have completely uh, wrapped into virtual machines and uh, controlled again using this pattern cloud kitchens are modern aggregation and uh, food waste minimization concept that takes multiple restaurant gastro businesses together, puts them into the single space so you can aggregate the losses, you can aggregate your supply chain and uh, brings uh, lots of interesting potential for savings. Uh, another application uh, where uh, I have used pretty much similar pattern has been uh, distribution where you put the actual mixing and cooking into the distribution agent so uh, the trucks moving around San Francisco, they had uh, robots inside of it that were cooking the tea, th that were preparing the tea, cooking cookies and uh, getting them ready to the final customer. So we were able to achieve less than uh, 20 minutes delivery everywhere. And uh, that was thanks to optimization, automation. Uh, I would like to give some uh, space for questions uh, uh, less than I expected but uh, to follow up uh, there are some nice readings on how the composite AI operates these days and uh, except for the first one which is uh, conceptually how we can synthesize uh, symbolic domains automatically uh, the last three are written by me and they are at uh, the top uh, AI conference for planning uh, ACAPS 2021 and one uh, blog uh, at Schlumberger on how um, reinforcement learning can encapsulate composite AI and intelligent automation together. Thank you for listening and Okay, question time. Uh, I have a question. It's like a more like a political question, by the way. So scary. Uh, I'm a big I'm a, I'm a big fan of autom autom automation. Uh, I have like a more than 500 applications in my smartphone, so I'm trying to optimize uh, everything what's possible. So the thing is that uh, you 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 are basically aware that. Everything you are just mentioned will replace like a millions and millions or billions of people with the robots or automats. So the question is, okay. So the question is uh, because many people, many people think that uh, in the following ten years, for example, uh, like millions of people won't be like unemployed, but but unemployable. You know what I mean. So they they won't be able to to do anything usable. So I think so many many people, especially in California, they are thinking about the concept we just call uh, UBI, Universal Basic Income, just for people who are re replaced by automats. So what do you think about this concept? Do you think it's moral? Do you think that we it's inevitable to to accept UBI, or how <coughs> how how do you want to solve this like a social problem? We are, we, we are going to face in the following years? Uh, good question. Uh, so mm, I'm not particularly focusing on solving the social impact. Uh, first of all, uh, people are really good at uh, industrial revolutions and uh, we have went through so many industrial revolutions without uh, really uh, any, any trouble that I'm not afraid about this revolution. I'm focused on generating value. 
we are uh, we can show that intelligent automation generates value. It's just uh, there is no question about it. It's very direct to evaluate. And uh, as long as we generate value, we are bringing something to society. And uh, I think that universal basic income is uh, one option that is going to come on the list, uh, how that extra value is going to be used. And uh, I can imagine that five years from now, multiple countries around the world will have uh, universal basic income. Thanks for your opinion. Other questions? Thank you. Um, thanks so much for the talk. And um, I think the examples you have given in the talk is mainly around using AIs for specific tasks. What's your thoughts around AI taking over the world? And uh <laughs> well, I think that uh, a larger danger than AI taking over the world. Uh, AI, AI is not. It's not really that smart. It uh, helps us with uh, some tasks that we tell it to help us with, and uh, that's it. There is no, no more intelligence, there is no sentience, nothing is happening there. But, uh, but could it like learn itself um, and like improve itself and would it ultim like ultimately it will have like a mind of its own? We are, we are very far from that. On the other hand, uh, I, see, I see another danger. Uh, that we use intelligent technologies, AI, so much that we become lazy ourselves and we start to degenerate. That's, uh, I think, larger danger than uh, AI taking over the world. <laughs> Fair enough, thank you. Maybe I'd like to add that we have like a general artificial intelligence, like GPT-3, you know, like that um, is, is able to communicate is it, is it really uh, AGI? I, it's a very uh, large statistical model. It's yeah. a corpus. It's not going to become sentient. It's not going to uh, come up with new ideas. It's going to statistically replicate what it has observed, and it's going to be a good predictor for uh, generating the next word in a sequence which you can chain into very long, se long sequences and generate reasonable text. I don't, uh, I don't see it becoming uh, sentient and, uh, and killing your cat or something like that. Did you know the case a few, few months ago, uh, some employee of Google, yes, yes, yes. Uh, he basically uh, left Google after he, uh, he basically published information that he thought that his artificial intelligence or Google developed artificial intelligence, it's sentient? Uh, well, uh, it's a personal opinion of one person and uh, lots of drugs are legal in California at the time. Okay, some other questions? It's a really interesting topic. Okay, two questions. Thank you. I would like to ask you, do you see AI and Web3 growing together? Do you see good uh, showcases already? Um, I have seen, so uh, b at this moment, uh, I don't have the definition of Web3 in my head, but uh, I have seen a combination of uh, web design, web technologies, uh, HTML together with uh, different helpful AI. It can be AI that uh, helps you to generate a design that is uh, fitting your purpose. So you can just define um, some high level uh, expectation that you have uh, from the web design and uh, the AI can help you to generate the rest. This is an application that was getting lots of attention. Uh, it has been done through also GPT-3. It has been done through constrained programming when you are defining some configurable web design that uh, has an infinitely large space of options, how it can form, and you are just uh, ticking it, uh, giving it the right instructions. So this is the this is direction I see. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's not, uh, I, I mean, I haven't uh, been focusing on web design for some time, but uh, this is what I have seen at conferences. I'm uh, up to date with uh, conferences that are uh, 
that are capturing uh, everything new that happens in AI. It, I have seen lots of development in reinforcement learning, in music and AI. And uh, there is uh, lots of bridging happening when uh, deep, uh, deep reinforcement learning, deep learning has been bridged with traditional operations research and machine learning, uh, not machine learning, and uh, symbolic reasoning. So this has been development that is very active. I haven't seen uh, uh, the web design uh, combination with AI, but uh, that's because I haven't focused, it, focused on it. There are conferences that are designed for web designers, and I assume that they also have their deep learning section. Uh, so right now, um, Facebook and Google have some of the world's best AI researchers, and some would argue, especially people here, that they violate privacy and are net negative, because I know you talked about how you're in this for value. Can you speak about that? I, I understand that you're not part of that because you're at an oil and gas company and obviously the world needs energy, but just your thoughts on uh, privacy versus convenience. AI seems to really help with the latter, but maybe hurt the former. Uh, that's a good question and also a little bit thin ice for me. Uh, that's when it becomes political. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a scientist, I must say it's absolutely amazing to, for example, uh, from the scientific point of view, of course. It's amazing to have all the data at single spot and not have to think about uh, any privacy because then you can really efficiently build uh, nice models. And this is what's happening in China because uh, privacy doesn't exist so much there. Uh, and when I look at it as a, a person who wouldn't like to have uh, his personal data captured and uh, having engines built on top of it, I uh, can understand the need that it shouldn't be happening, that shouldn't be completely open. Um, companies like Google and Facebook that are operating in under multiple different legislations have really a hard time at uh, compliance with all of them, and they spend a lot of money on uh, being able to comply. And uh, it seems to me uh, that it's a kind of push and pull battle that uh, they always try to get as much as they can to uh, have the scientists uh, do a good job. And that job can be that uh, it can, can be sometimes helpful. It can be sometimes, uh, well, not necessarily improving your life. Uh, let's say that uh, an engine can uh, start recommending an alcoholic to buy more alcohol and uh, triggering him because the ML system has learned that this is how it is able to sell him more alcohol. Or it can be giving you good predictions when you are uh, driving in a car, which is helpful for you. So there are cases when it's helpful, when it's not so helpful. And uh, the scientists will always try to get uh, more value out of data. And at the same time, the regulators from the countries uh, that are aware of the protection of personal data are going to push back. And this is going to go back and forth. And at this moment, we are converging somewhere. And uh, where it is going to be, I don't know myself. Um, we have to see how it turns out. And I, we can, I think everyone can contribute uh, their opinion through the political systems, government systems that we are part of to make decisions there. I don't have, I don't have universal solution. I don't have ultimate opinion. I can describe what is the state of the world. There are two sides pushing against each other. We can see, for example, in Europe, GDPR legislation, uh, which basically caused that many US company, companies stopped offering their services to the European market. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the for the presentation. And uh, what are your thoughts on the future of uh, quantum computing? If you have uh, any experience in that field, uh, I do. I do. Yeah, it's uh, because quantum computing uh, is expected to be the execution engine for most of the AI. And uh, the prognosis, uh, talking about uh, the current state with uh, top scientists, uh, I just uh, three weeks ago I was in San Francisco and uh, we were discussing it. Uh, at uh, Palo Alto Research Center, and uh, it's 
it's not that practical, and uh, the it's uh, ev it's even a question if quantum computing will ever be practical, unfortunately. I would love to see it being usable, but uh, at this moment we can do some limited quantum annealing. We can build very small, uh, very small, uh, very small qubit uh, processors, but uh, we don't know absolutely how to scale it. To solve reasonable problems, we would have to have some concept of parallelism for quantum computers because they are hard to build uh, for certain size, and we don't have any parallelism. We don't know how to, uh, how to do quantum entanglement for processors that are not super close to each other. Uh, so that's the hard part, and uh, we do not see real results there at this moment. So we don't need to be afraid uh, of quantum computers to crack, for example, asymmetric cryptography. So in, in case of Bitcoin, for example. I don't believe so at this moment, and for the next 20 years, maybe. Yeah. Maybe the last question? Okay, the last question. Um, do you think machines can gain consciousness or fake it? Oh, ah, uh, machines. That depends. So as uh, it's going back to a uh, question of uh, Skynet, which I got before, and uh, Consciousness, sentience uh, is, uh, I think, uh, at different level, fundamentally different level of uh, our capabilities than we are at this moment. At this moment, we are at applied artificial intelligence. Everything that is uh, practically useful is just applied artificial intelligence when we uh, learned how to uh, solve some small problem and we learn how to do it well. and. Uh, we sometimes accidentally learn how to do something that is interesting and entertaining. Uh, for example, uh, the DALI, the uh, automatically generated images. I was uh, spending some time uh, experimenting, and uh, it's amazing how you can have such a large statistical model that you can generate images automatically based on the keywords. But uh, that's very far from any, any consciousness and sentience. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of our time. Uh, Philip, thanks a lot for your interesting presentation and especially for your comprehensive answers. Thanks a lot for being here.